All right, turn to Matthew 14. Uh, we're going to look at the first two scenes in this chapter, and it gives us a huge contrast. I, I entitled it A Tale of Two Feasts, and it's basically the first feast we'll look at is an elaborate feast for a king. It's his birthday, King Herod, uh, Herod Antipas, and he's having this big feast for his birthday, and it's crazy. There's, you know, just feasting on all kinds of delicacies and drinking, and it's just a crazy time. But then the other feast we're going to look at is a feast that Jesus, it's much more glorious. He's going to feed thousands of people with a little boy's lunch and uh, little five little loaves of bread and two small fish, and he does an amazing miracle, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. So let's pick up in chapter 14, starting in verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his, to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Now remember, it's back in chapter 11 where John the Baptist was imprisoned by uh, King Herod. And um, he sends two of his disciples to Jesus and he's been in prison about 9, 10, 11 months or so, almost a year. And he sends disciples to Jesus. And the question they have for him is, are you the one or should we look for another? Are you the promised Messiah or do we need to look for somebody else? Because he's thinking, uh, Jesus, you're supposed to be taking over. You're supposed to be ruling. You're supposed to be kicking all these enemies out. That's how they pictured the Messiah so Jesus tells the disciples, now go and tell John, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame are you know, healed, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised from the dead. So go let him know. In other words, Jesus wants the imprisoned John the Baptist to know, I am the Messiah. Everything is on schedule according to God's plan. So hang in there, John. Don't worry. Everything's under control. Then Jesus tells all the people that John was the greatest man born among women. He says he's the greatest prophet of all the prophets. But again, John's struggling a bit because he is stuck in prison for almost a year. And as we'll see, it's all because John spoke out against King Herod. Um, by the way, it gets a little confusing when you start talking about all the King Herods because there's four King Herods in the New Testament. Uh, real briefly, King Herod the Great, uh, he's the one that he ruled from 37 BC to when Jesus was about two years old, and he was nasty. He was mean. He was a very smart man, a very great architect. Many of the ruins in Israel today, some of the best ruins are because of what Herod the Great did. He built the Temple Mount. He had it leveled off. He remodeled the Jewish temple, and it became known as Herod's Temple. He's the one that developed underwater uh, cement that he built a whole harbor in Caesarea, and you can still see the remnants of that today. He built Masada. He built you know, Michaelis. He built all these different um, palaces, just an amazing person, but he was very wicked. He gave himself the name Herod the Great, even though he was probably about four foot ten. And uh, he thought more of himself than he ought to. He had at least nine wives, many sons, but he would kill them whenever he felt like it. And I think it was uh, Caesar Augustus said, it's better to be Herod's pig than it is to be his son. Because Herod was half Jewish and he wouldn't eat pork, but he would kill his kids. I mean, he was just a very wicked man. He's the one who slaughtered all the babies in Bethlehem when the wise men told him that Jesus or the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. And so he kills all those two years old and under. The Herod we're looking at here in chapter 14, this is Herod's son, Herod Antipas. He ruled after his father died to 39 AD. He's the one that um, has John put to death. He's the one that Jesus will stand before. Remember when Jesus is arrested, he's taken before Pontius Pilate. Pilate sends him to this Herod, and Jesus won't say anything to him. And he was, a, again, we'll see here in a moment, he was a very wicked man. He did not listen to John the Baptist. He didn't repent of his sins. So when he stands before, or Jesus is standing before him, Jesus won't talk to him. He won't even say a word to him because it's like, well, if you didn't listen to my cousin John the Baptist, I'm not going to tell you anything either. 
So when he dies, he's replaced by his son, Herod Agrippa. We read about Herod Agrippa in um, chapter 12 of the book of Acts. He's the one that has James the Apostle's head cut off. He's the one that has Peter arrested and put in prison. At the end of chapter 12, um, he gives his big speech and all the people are saying, oh, he's got the voice of a god, not a man. And God sends an angel and strikes him and he gets eaten up with worms. He dies a few days later. Just a brutal situation. And then the last one is Herod Agrippa II. He's the one that the Apostle Paul will stand before in Acts chapter 25 and 26, and he will give him the gospel. No uncertain terms. He lays it out. Jesus Christ died for you. He rose from the dead. You know, he's the one you need to believe. And let me read a couple of verses here on the screen. Acts 26, starting in verse 27, the Apostle Paul says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but all, also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. And with that, Herod Agrippa II stands up and the meeting's over. He doesn't want to hear any more. So again, we're back here in chapter 14. This is Herod Antipas. And when he hears that Jesus is doing all these mighty miracles, in his mind, it's weird because he's thinking, that's John the Baptist risen from the dead. He's going to be tormenting me. I mean, he was very upset about this. And so now we're going to read what he did to John the Baptist. Look at verse 3. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John the Baptist had said to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. Now, again, John is being held in a palace which is near um, the place where he was baptizing in the Jordan River. This is where we baptize people um, two years ago in this month, uh, that part of the Jordan River. It's just before it goes into the Dead Sea. Anyway, John was calling on the people, especially the religious leaders, you need to repent. You need to get right with God. Uh, the kingdom of, kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he calls the, the religious leaders a brood of vipers who warned you about the wrath of God that is coming. And I'm sure this King Herod heard all about these things. And he comes out and he probably heard John as well. And John blasted him. You are a sinner. You're an adulterer. You need to repent and get right with God. But instead of repenting of his sin, we're told that Herod listens to his wife, Herodias, who was probably telling her husband, hey, you're the king. Make this guy shut up. And so he has John the Baptist arrested. But here's what it says in Mark chapter 6 about this, starting in verse 19. Therefore Herodias, that's Herod's wife, held it against him, John, and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. It's interesting because we're told that Herod Antipas would call on John the Baptist, you know, who's in prison there, and he would bring him before him just to listen to him rant and rave and call him to repentance. In other words, that was his form of entertainment. The king thought, well, long before TV's around and radio and Fox News, I need to get worked up here, so I'll bring this guy in. And so John the Baptist would just probably preach the gospel to him. You know, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You need to repent. You know, wrath of God is coming upon you. And it says that he liked to just hear him because it was like entertainment for him. How sad. Herod did not heed God's word. Herod's heart just got harder and harder over the years. Now, I can relate to this. I've mentioned it before. When I was growing up as a kid, my dad, who was very, very anti-Jesus and God, Anytime there's a Billy Graham crusade on the TV, he would turn it on. He'd want to watch that. And I was like 10, 11 years old, and I'd be looking like, okay, here's Billy Graham. You know, you need to repent. You know, come to Jesus. And I'd be looking at my dad, and he'd be mocking him and making fun of him. And, 
And it was weird because I didn't know any difference. And so I started mocking Billy Graham. I'd imitate him. And my parents would think I was funny because I was imitating Billy Graham. And that's why I say when I got saved, man, I should have been toasted when I was a kid. Man, I was so rebellious. I was so stupid. And I didn't realize till after I got saved, boy, Lord, you are so gracious to a sinner like me. But here's Herodias. And she wants John the Baptist shut up because she was married to Philip. That was Herod's half-brother, and Herod took Herodias from his half-brother and married her, even though they weren't divorced, and so that's why John was coming against him. Verse 6, but when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore, he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So here he is selling, celebrating his birthday with a bunch of his guests. Again, in Mark's gospel, it says that he was giving a feast for his nobles, his chief uh, officers, the chief men of Galilee. It was a big pagan celebration. They would have had lots of food, lots of drink. They were just all getting drunk. They would have, you know, just a lot of fleshly stuff going on. And Herodias, being the shrewd woman that she was, knew that her husband would probably get crazy, probably say something stupid. And so to show her where, you know, show us where her heart is, she sends in her daughter to dance, this seductive dance before all the guests, before these drunk men. And she says to her, okay, when he says, I'm going to give you whatever you want, and in another gospel it says, up to half my kingdom, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. She says, ask for John the, he John the Baptist's head on a platter. So it pretty much tells you all you need to know about Herodias. Verse 8. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. Again, it was all prearranged. But can you imagine how wicked Herodias was? And this was because in her mind, this was the only way to bring an end to all the conviction and the guilt that she had because of the truth of John's preaching. She didn't want to hear it anymore. But as a prophet, John was speaking on behalf of God and she just tuned him out, but you cannot stop God's word. Look at verse 9. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent and had John beheaded in prison, and his head was brought on a platter given to the, mother, uh, the girl, and she brought it to her mother. So what a twisted, wicked family this was. At the same time, what a pathetic person King Antipas, Herod the Antipas is, because you talk about a contrast between Herod and John the Baptist. I mean, John the Baptist did not fear any man. Whatever they said, he, he's like, I don't care what you tell me. I don't care what you say about me. I'm here to represent God. I'm here to speak the truth about God and the kingdom of God. But Herod did not fear God. He feared man. He was only concerned about saving his own reputation instead of saving John's life. But now, John the Baptist, at the edge of the sword, he's free. He's literally set free. He's no longer in prison there in this jail at the palace there at Nicolaus. But he is set free forever. On the other hand, Herod was a prisoner of his sin. And he would eventually be banished by the emperor of Rome. And he would die just in his wickedness and his sin. Well, now look at verse 12. Then his disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. So after they bury the body of John the Baptist, they went and told Jesus what had happened. And that's a good example for all of us. Whatever's going on in your life, go and tell Jesus about it. Talk to the Lord about it. Whatever you're going through, it could be sadness, it could be depression, hardship, heartache. We need to go to Jesus and talk to Him about it because we know He loves us. We know He cares for us. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 tells us, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, 
Notice, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Wicked politicians cannot do anything for you, but the ultimate politician, the king of kings, Jesus, can do abund abundantly above all that we could hope or imagine. So John's disciples go to Jesus, and that's the best place they could have gone after all, it was John who said of Jesus, Behold, or look at, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's the one he pointed his disciples to, the Lord Jesus. And so that's who they go to. Now, verse 13, we see the second feast coming up here in a moment. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. Now, again, it's in Mark chapter 6. Look at this verse in verse 31 that we're told that Jesus tells his disciples to get into the boat. And this is what he says after the news of John being killed. And he said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest for a while. For there were many coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. I mean, ministry at this point was just so hectic, so crazy. Multitudes following Jesus. He was just going from morning till night, you know, ministering, healing, doing all kinds of things. And he's, he's grieving in his own heart. My cousin, John the Baptist, just put to death. So let's get out of here. So he gets in the boat with the disciples. They go to the other side. They go up on this hill by themselves to a deserted place. That's a good principle for all of us. We need to come aside by ourselves to a deserted place and rest with Jesus for a while. I mean, we're living in a very fast-paced society. We're being bombarded all the time by all the latest technological stuff that's out there. It's hard to turn off all the social media and find a nice, quiet place just to be alone with the Lord. But we need to do it. It's so important. Turn off the TV, turn off your computer, turn off your cell phone. There's a thousand and one other things that will vie for your attention and your time, but we need to get alone with Christ. Remember what we saw back in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28? This is what Jesus tells us. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, you're just burdened down, and I will give you rest. And so that's what he's doing with his disciples. Come away, let's... Find a place, a quiet place, and let's rest. So I can imagine the disciples thinking, all right, this is going to be great. We get to rest for a time. We'll get away with Jesus. Maybe have a retreat up on the hill and just have a weekend. Just us and the Lord. We'll kick back and relax. But whatever quiet time they had with Jesus was quickly shattered by thousands, literally thousands of people descending upon their little retreat. And I can almost hear these guys letting out a sigh, a collective sigh, a groan, like, oh, no, look at all the people coming. Man, there goes our quiet time with Jesus. Again, this is why it's so important to set aside time on a regular basis, because you never know what interruptions, blessed interruptions, God's interruptions can come at any time. So you need to be ready whenever. This is why Peter says, 1 Peter 3.15, I sent Aaron part of this verse uh, Christmas Eve, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And so it's like, you're on in a half hour, Aaron. He's like, oh, okay. He was ready. Praise the Lord. We always need to be ready because you never know who or what is coming into your life. Look at verse 14. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude. And he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. I mean, this is the heart of Jesus. He is our Savior. He is our Shepherd. It's in Mark's gospel talking about this same scene. Mark chapter 6, verse 34, it says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. And so he began to teach them many things. 
In Luke chapter 9, verse 11, again, the same scene, it says, But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him. And he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. And so when you look at all these accounts of this same scene, we see the love of Jesus. We see the compassion of Jesus toward those who are spiritually hungry, who needed the word of God. And we also see the grace and mercy of Jesus as he also looks at them and sees their physical need. They needed a physical touch. They needed a physical healing. Remember, Jesus does all this even in the midst of his sorrow. He's doing this because he's sorrowing over the loss of his cousin. I mean, he grieved. He wept at Lazarus' tomb. He had emotions. He was a man just like us, fully God, fully human. So he knows exactly what we're going through. It tells us in Isaiah 53, verse 3, it's not on the screen, but you can look it up later. It says about Jesus, he is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So he knows what you're going through. He can relate to anything and everything we go through. He is tempted in all ways like we are, it says in Hebrews, yet without sin. Praise the Lord for that. Now look at verse 15. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place. They're out in the middle of nowhere, up in the hills. And the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. So this is what we read in John 6, starting in verse 5. Again, this same scene. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread. Remember, a denarii, a denarii was a day's wage. So 200 days' wages isn't enough. He says, it's not an, uh, that much bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. Even if we go out and buy is, all this bread, we can't even get them to lose their hunger. They'll still be hungry. When you look at the various accounts of this scene, and the various responses from the disciples, it's obvious they are overwhelmed by what's going on. Like Jesus, they have compassion for the multitudes. But unlike Jesus, they can't do anything about it. What's their solution? Uh, send them away. They're, they need to go now. Maybe they can get to a little in and out burger, you know, in a village down the road if they go there now. I hope we get in and out soon. That's a whole different thing. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Where was they? Oh. Their other solution? It's like our government. Let's throw more money at them. Well, even 200 denarii is not going to do much. That's pretty much the only solution they can come up with. Well, look at verse 16. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Now, that would have got their brains ticking, I'm sure. Again, in John's gospel, Jesus said this in order to test them. In other words, Jesus want, wants his disciples, look at every option. Look at your resources. See what you can do. And they're like, we got nothing. What are we going to do here? This is an impossible situation. We need to take this to Jesus and let him figure it out. And that's the whole point. They need to bring this to Jesus and let him figure it out. This will be one of the most important lessons they will ever learn. Whatever problem you encounter, bring it to Jesus. He has the best solution because we already heard he knows what he's going to do, but he's wanting them to think about what they're doing. Look at verse 17. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them here to me. Now, this is where it's good to have a harmony of the Gospels, and you look at the other Gospels and how they put all this together, and it's in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 9, where we're told about Peter's brother, Andrew, and he comes to Jesus and he says this, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? 
Now, it's interesting to me that it mentions this lad, this young boy, whose mother must have packed him this little lunch, saying, hey, son, where are you going? Wow, there's this multitude of people that are following Jesus. I'm going to go follow the crowd. Okay, you got anything to eat? No. Well, here, take a couple breadsticks, a couple little dried fish. Have fun. Okay, thanks, Mom. And somehow, Andrew, in the multitudes of thousands of people, finds this little guy. He's got the five little, they're like basically little barley breadsticks. Something like you'd get at, you know, Olive Garden or something. And two little dried up fish. But he brings them to Jesus. Andrew does. Who knows what was going through his mind? You know, what are you going to do with this, Lord? This is all I can find. When Jesus tells the disciples to give the multitude something to eat, this is his option. The key to all this is verse 18, where Jesus says, Bring them here to me. In other words, whatever you have, no matter how insignificant you think it is, bring it to Jesus. He can do above and beyond all that we could hope or imagine. Look at verse 19. Then he, the Lord, commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. Pause there for a moment because it's in Luke's gospel. We read a little bit more about this. Luke 9, 14. It says, For there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to his disciples, Make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and made them all sit down. And in a moment we'll see that there were about 5,000 men plus all the women plus all their children. They guesstimate easily fifteen to 20,000 people are on this hillside there with Jesus when this is taking place. Here's another interesting side note. This is the only miracle, before you get to the resurrection of Christ, this is the only miracle all four Gospels record. This one here. This tells us the kind of impact this had on all these disciples. And again, the, the Apostle John wrote his, the Gospel of John, about 60 years later. So it was still very impactful. We'll see why in a moment. Verse 19 again. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. This is amazing on so many levels. Again, Jesus does not ask his disciples to do anything great and miraculous. They couldn't. All he wants them to do is bring what you got to me. So they've got five little barley loaves, two small fish. Bring them to me, he says. Listen, none of us have anything great and awesome to give to people around us. But what we have, we need to surrender it to the Lord. Whatever you have, whatever you have, whatever, no matter how much or little, it comes from the Lord first and foremost. And only Jesus can multiply anything that we have. If somebody says, oh, I'd like a glass of cold water. Remember Jesus says, if you give somebody a glass of cold water in my name. Well, who made the water? You didn't make it. God made it. So we're just distributors. He's the one that creates all things. He's the manufacturer of all things. We just distribute it. So they didn't produce any miracle, but he says, whatever you have, bring it to me. Some people might say, Lord, right now, I don't have anything but a broken heart. I don't have anything but a, you know discouragement. Well, he says, bring it to me. Let me deal with your issues. Let me deal with your pain. Let me deal with whatever you're facing. That's the lesson they are learning, and this will carry them through many trials, tribulations, persecutions that all these disciples are going to face. All the victories they're going to face, they will look back on this miracle. Remember when Peter and John, in Acts chapter 3, they're going up to the beautiful temple, and they're by the gate called Beautiful, and as they're walking up there, there's a poor beggar. He's lame and he has nothing and he's begging for money. And Peter looks at him and says, what, silver and gold? I don't have. I don't have anything to give you. But what I do have in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he takes him by the hand and that guy was instantly healed. Peter didn't do it. It was Jesus working through Peter that did that miracle. And so that comes from this, watching what Jesus does with these, this fish, these little loaves of bread. 
they will learn that Jesus will provide everything they need. And as they take the gospel throughout the, you know, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, they will realize Jesus will provide whatever we need. He'll give us the strength we need because all of them but John would die a horrible death. These men, great men of faith, they would be crucified upside down like Peter. They would be burned at the stake. They would have their heads chopped off. They would go through horrendous torture. But the lesson is Jesus will provide whatever we need whenever we need it. And so here with the 12 disciples, he tells them in Mark's gospel, have the people sit in groups of hundreds and fifties. Now, you know how people are. You got 15 to 20,000 people and you say, okay, you're going to get into groups of fifties. Well, I don't want to sit with them. I want to sit over there with my friends. What's Jesus doing up there? I'm hungry. That's what we'd probably do. But anyway, they're all sitting there. They finally get him. There. How long did that take? I don't know. But Jesus looks up to heaven. It says he blessed the little loaves and fishes. He gives them to the 12 disciples. And again, they become distributors to the masses of people. Jesus is always the initiator. He's the creator. Remember what it says in 1 John 4, we love God because He first loved us. Again, He initiates. He loved us first. That's why we love the Lord. He blesses us so that we can bless others. He gives us the gospel so that we can share the good news with those around us. We can't create anything, but God has given us all that we need for life and godliness. We need to distribute what God has done. Now here when it says Jesus blessed and broke the loaves, it literally means that as fast as he could break it, because it says he breaks the loaves, as soon as he does that, loaves of bread just start falling out of his hand into these baskets. Same with the fish, just fish start filling up these baskets. I mean, this is creation taking place here with the loaves and the fish. He fills them up, and then the 12 disciples, they're running. How long would that take? You got all these groups of 50 and hundreds, 15 to 20,000 people. They got, now there's two different words for basket. This one with the 5,000, it means like a big, large, like a laundry basket. When he feeds the 4,000, it uses a different term for baskets. It's more like a, a bowl shaped basket. And so this one is like a laundry basket. And so here are these guys, bread and fish, hauling them to these groups of 50 probably just pouring them out in the middle, and they're just scarfing it down. And they go back in there, there's more, it keeps coming out, you dump it again. And they keep doing this. And we'll see that they keep doing this until everybody's filled completely up with bread and fish. I mean, what a workout this must have been. Look at verse 20. So they all ate and were filled and they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Again, a couple of important things to take note of here. First of all, it says they all ate and were filled. The word filled in the Greek literally means to be gorged. It means to be stuffed. It's like a Thanksgiving meal. You just had your Thanksgiving meal. And good thing they wore robes because they needed to loosen the belt. It's like, you know, you eat a big Thanksgiving meal and say, like, oh, I wish I would have worn my sweatpants. <laughs> this is stretchy pants right now. I need this. Here's all these people. Again, 15 to 20,000 stuffed to the max. And, and they're thinking, oh, man, this is the best bread. I mean, Jesus isn't giving them, you know, dried tuna fish stuff. I mean, this is the best bread, the best fish they could ever imagine. And they're like, this is great. And they just get stuffed. This is how God wants us to be spiritually filled to the max, overflowing with the Holy Spirit. When Paul says, don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, be filled. It means be filled up, overflowing with the Spirit, fully content in the Lord, fully content in the loving care of Jesus. Another thing we see here, again, Jesus tells the disciples, gather up the fragments, the leftovers, Nothing was going to go to waste. And so each one of the 12, remember it said earlier, they were hungry. They're not hungry anymore because now they're dragging up a full basket full and they just sit there before Jesus. And can you imagine just the look on their face when they drag these baskets and it's full of bread and fish? It's like, oh, 
This is crazy. We were hungry. Here's another interesting thing. Jesus made just enough fish and bread to make everybody, all 12,000, 15,000 people stuffed and exactly 12 basketfuls of leftovers. So he's the creator. He knows exactly what he's doing. And so they are just blown away by what Christ has just done. This is what the Apostle Paul says. And sometimes I wonder, you know, the Holy Spirit inspires these guys to write the things they write in the New Testament. And I can imagine the Apostle Paul, who's a good friend of Luke, who writes the Gospel of Luke, who records this whole thing. And maybe this is in the back of his mind when he's writing this to the Ephesians, Ephesians 3, verses 19 to 21. And this is his prayer for the Ephesians. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. That means more than you can even imagine or comprehend. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God, gorged. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. So is there anything too hard for God to do in your life? Is there anything too hard? Oh, I got this problem. I got this, you know, habit. I've got this addiction. I don't know. I can't give it to Jesus. He can do abundantly above all that we ask or think according to, not your power, the power that works in us. To Him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now this miracle also shows us that Jesus knew exactly what He's doing, exactly how much He needed to make, and the disciples are just blown away Earlier it says they were tired, they were hungry, but now they're just more filled and stuffed than they could ever imagine. And I'm sure they're thinking, wow, Jesus can do this with a Lunchable? What can He do when we're facing all these other trials and hardships and struggles? Well, they'll find out. Lord willing, we'll find out next week <laughs> when we come back to this because they're stuffed. They've been working all day, but their day's not even over yet. He's going to send him in a boat in the middle of a storm. Again, because Jesus knows exactly what he's doing, and they have no idea. They're sitting there like, oh, this is awesome. We finally get to just rest. Our bellies are full. But then they're going to go into a storm here in a moment. A tale of two feasts. One had everything the world could want, but it ended with seduction and death. And this one, which was wonderful and simple, had everything the world needs, and that is to be filled, to be satisfied with Jesus, to let Him meet your needs. Like Philippians 4, 19, that He gives us abundantly above all that we could ask or think, and He also supplies our needs abundantly with His goodness, with His grace, with His mercy. The biggest need that any of us have is to be forgiven of our sins. The biggest need the world around us has is to be saved by the blood of Jesus. And He has created you to be a distributor for what He has blessed you with, what He has given to you. Again, the gospel of Christ is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who will believe. When Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, I wonder how much of this was going through their minds when... Um, well, Paul writes this one. This is what Jesus re revealed to him. I'll close with this verse. 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23. We usually quote these verses when we do communion. Again, Lord willing, next week we'll do communion. But notice, Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. There's the same pattern. I received from the Lord because He's the manufacturer. What I deliver to you, that's all we do is distribute, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which He was betrayed, took bread, just like He did in this scene here, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And you think just that loaf of bread that he broke, passed it around the table to the disciples, and they ripped off a chunk of it, and they dipped it into the sop, and they would eat from it. And it was just 
the beginning. Jesus being broken, look how many people he has met their needs. He has saved through his death, burial, and resurrection. In the same manner, he also took the cup, the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Again, his death is sufficient. His blood is sufficient to cleanse you and me and anyone else of all their sins if they will come to Christ for salvation.